Hello, uh, Tom Stewart here with Clean Business Today. I'm with my partner, Liz Trotter. Hello, Liz. Okay. And got a special guest today, David Kaiser. Um, David Kaiser, I've known David for, for many years. Um, he's a, uh, I guess, authoritative figure in the whole uh, residential cleaning space. He was uh, one of the, the founders of ARCSI, uh, its uh, initial president. And um, still uh, spends a whole lot of time in the residential cleaning space, uh, spent a lot of time studying the science of cleaning and was was one of the uh, key figures in helping us put together the HCT program, writing the book and the training program. And um, David is, is here to uh, speak about a really important event that took place today and share with us a little bit about uh, what he's learned and, and how it's going to uh, affect us as cleaning business owners. Um, David, you want to want to share with us uh, how you spent your day today? Sure. So originally, uh, the event I attended today was to be an in-person event in Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, obviously, it didn't happen as an in-person event. And can you hear me okay? Because I'm getting a little feedback. I don't know Wait a minute. if that's just me or not. <clears throat> I'm hearing just a little bit of feedback, but David, we will try and mute. Uh, what we found is if only one person is unmuted, it works a little bit better. So I'll mute right now for you. Oh, well, thank you so much, Liz. After so, I say thanks to Winter. Sorry. So uh, today was uh, uh, the event uh, in, in virtual uh, setting of the Clean Industry Research Institute's uh, webinar. And uh, they had a lot of uh, world-renowned experts from Australia and university research scientists and doctors with a lot of letters behind their name. Uh, not medical doctors, but uh, research doctors, microbiologists, public health experts, those kinds of folks. A lot of them are actually working on the uh, on the front lines of, uh, of handling this COVID. They're working in hospitals. They're training people on infection control protocols. And so they took the time today. Uh, this wasn't the original program. Uh, the original program had different speakers, and they just changed it up recently. And so the uh, slate of speakers today... Uh, was for the most part uh, completely different, or or at least the programs that they presented were different if it was the same speakers. And <clears throat> there's a lot of information about uh, the science of cleaning, especially as was presented today, that really applies to people in the residential cleaning space. And so Tom and I talked briefly earlier at one of the breaks, and. Uh, he thought it might be a good idea for, for me to share some of those things with you. My role uh, now is, is primarily as a consultant and uh, an expert in the industry. I work with some companies and uh, the industry as a whole to uh, try to help bring more of the science of cleaning into people's uh, operations. But the agenda <clears throat> was, uh, I'll just give you some of the titles. Um, the first uh, uh, program was uh, delivered by a, a, a lady named Patty Olinger, and she's actually part of ISSA now. She is the executive director of, of uh, what they call GBAC, the Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council. And um, her title of her first uh, presentation was Virus Characteristics and Communication Strategies. And she talked in there about how important it was for us to be able to communicate as professionals and experts and essential workers in the industry um, knowledgeably and with authority about how to remove this risk of coronavirus or other viruses or other threats, uh, uh, MRSA or whatever you might have, um, and, and how to go about doing that with your clients and with your employees and with other stakeholders, with the community at large. Um, and we can talk more about that. I'm going to give you a cap of all of the presentations, just like Patty's, and then uh, we can open it up to questions and get into more detail as people uh, have uh, interest. Uh, Gene Cole, a good friend of ours in the industry, um, uh, know him and his wife well. 
Um, he's a microbiologist and a, a public health uh, guru. Uh, he does uh, a lot of research in North Carolina and his laboratory. And he talked about what you need to know about pandemics and COVID-19. Um, Richard Sonnesy, a, a researcher, did uh, uh, why and how and why we test. Why we test, why we test before we clean, why we test after we clean, what, what's the purpose of testing, and how do we test when we're cleaning a house or cleaning a bathroom? How does that even work uh, to know that we did a good job? Um, John Richter, a mechanical engineer and a designer of a lot of uh, you know, cleaning equipment in, in the world of uh, uh, the janitorial um, uh, uh, industry, uh, did high performance cleaning, what it is and why it's so important. Uh, <clears throat> he talked a lot about measurement as well. And then we had Greg, Greg Whiteley from Australia talk about meeting the challenges associated with effective disinfection. And he really spoke a lot about what COVID-19 is, how it's different from other viruses, and what we can do to really protect ourselves and protect those around us. Um, and when you go through all this to hear it, you're like, oh, these people, and it can be overwhelming just hearing a capsule of it. But I want you to know as you go through it, especially with people who have some background, maybe who have taken an HCT class or have some training that they have gotten, um, it, there's, a, there's a confidence level that I got from listening to the presentations today. There's a confidence level that, you know what, we just have to know how to beat this thing. And so, um, so you know, David, it's kind of interesting that, that we're having that discussion here, you know, as primarily, you know, house cleaning professionals, because a lot of what you're talking about sounds like, you know, people putting on, you know, Tyvek suits and respirators and going in and fighting Ebola or something. But, uh, you know, would you say that this is becoming, this is becoming a lot more relevant in the house cleaning space? Cleaning business owners are asking questions, you know, how do I protect my employees? How do I protect my clients? You know, what do we need to do in order to uh, stop the spread of the infection within the community? Was there much discussion? Absolutely, oh. absolutely. And, and I'm gonna sum it up for you in just a couple of sentences. One is that the researchers and the scientists who go out and teach people about the threat in hospitals and and address infection control issues, all those people that were on that uh, presentation today, this is what they said. We know that we are the researchers. We need to, we need your help. We need your help, your cleaner's help, not your help, Tom, not your help, Liz, but the people that work for you, they need your help, their help because we need to teach them and train them because the threat is not COVID, it's the next one that comes and the one that comes after that. And they talked about how they are coming and they're going to be quicker and they may be more fierce. We don't even know. This one has taken us by surprise. They've never seen anything like this before. And they know that germs and viruses are smart. I will tell you that Greg Whiteley made the comment that the virus talking about HEPA filters and ways to trap it and ways to inactivate it and so forth. The virus has one job, one job. That is to get inside you and get in your lungs and kill you. That's the job. And we all have to be warriors. We all have to be warriors. They can't do it by themselves. And they know we need the knowledge and they can help us develop the knowledge and the skills and they want to. And that's what's exciting is about the fact that they're starting to pay attention to the fact that this industry should be respected, that, that the cleaner on the front line, not just the doctors and the nurses in the hospital, but the guy mopping the floor in the hospital needs the same respect as all the other people in the hospital. And that's the case for people in a home. Now, the training that Global BioRisk does, I got a picture off of the presentation. It's in a house. It's in a house. They're, they're training people how to do infection control and uh, 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 decontamination in a house. 
using full Tyvek suits and face shields and the whole thing. And the doctors and nurses had to pass a competency test in the training that they do in person. And do you know a lot of the doctors and nurses can't pass the competency trust test and so they are not allowed to be part of a team in a hospital uh, that goes out and does, you know, investigations and so forth because they can't get the Tyvek suit off without contaminating everything. Well, our cleaners do things like, like that all the time. We, we know how to take the gloves on and off, or if we don't, we should get trained and we can be, we can be trained. They did talk about the fact that a lot of equipment is really good and cool and unique, but a lot of it needs better standards. Vacuuming, vacuuming can, can really be a problem right now for people. One of the best things, I'll give everybody the worthwhile benefit of coming on this call right now. If you've got an infected situation in a home, one of the best things you can do in a home or any environment, indoor environment, is to leave the home, leave that indoor environment if you possibly can, and just let it sit. And the virus will inactivate over a few days. Yeah. Hey, David, uh, there's a, I'm sure there's a, a whole lot to, to, to unpack here. And sure. in, the, in, the, in, in the big picture, in the long run, you know, this whole the virus and the, the the focus that's going to be put on cleaning, not just as something to, to make indoor space look better, but actually to break the chain of infection and to and reduce the chance of, of somebody catching a deadly pathogen. You know, that's gonna that's gonna evolve out of this. But sitting here right here today on you know March 31st, there's a, a, a ton of cleaning business owners out there trying to figure out what they need to be doing today, given the risks that are out there. Is there anything that, that, that we can share that, that we can actually do something with tomorrow? Yes. Um, there's a gentleman named uh, Gavin McGregor, who is part of the Global Bio-Risk uh, Advisory Council. And he talked about, uh, I'm trying to get to the page here, um, the importance of every contractor knowing critical things about their employees, about their customers, about their vendors and other stakeholders. First of all, um, you need to, the very first thing you should do is if you are truly a professional, you need to make sure that you contact your government agency like Tom, you should contact Charleston or the county where you are, and you should let them know Castle Keepers is in the clean business. We've had special training. We have the capability to deliver whatever it is you have the capability to do. Don't, don't mislead them or misguide them or try to be opportunistic if you don't qualify for, for that level of service. And this again goes to the next time this happens, people are going to start getting trained. Companies like you're talking about that are trying to stay alive today, one thing they can do is they, they, can, they can communicate with their customers and say, look, we can clean under these conditions and they might need to do a risk assessment first. And that was talked about today and how to do that. For example, if nobody's in the home, then you could go in and clean. Um, and then they would still maybe need to use certain PPE and you would need to do training on that. Um, another thing uh, that they talked about is reach out to volunteer communities. Maybe you can't clean the house, but maybe you could go out and pick up the trash in the neighborhood and do a, a, a video segment on it and put it on YouTube and talk about what you are doing. Um, they talked about every employee of yours and every customer that wants to give it to you should share their emergency contact information with you. You should have a repository of all of your employees' emergency contact information and your family, your team. He has one for his family and they keep it in a place where everybody knows where it is and they have a copy of it. 
So, uh, uh, David, hey, David, I want to interrupt real quick here. Sure. Um, I like this idea about having the emergency contact info for all of your employees. How do you get around, like, you know, some of these uh, different things with HIPAA? HIPAA, and, HIPAA. right. Yeah. HIPAA. So here, you, they can sign a waiver or release if they want. If they don't want, then you don't get that. But you already have their home. You want to yeah. verify for employee relations, their <clears throat> home address and some of the basic contact. And, and that's, and, and, and like for ours, we had every employee sign a release that they were willing to share it with everybody in the company um, or their team. They did talk about this and it reminded me of my scuba diving days. This is so critical because we used to clean a lot just solo, right? Everybody needs a buddy. Everybody needs a buddy system, especially if you are in a heightened cleaning situation or a more intense cleaning protocol. Um, you need to be able to look if I'm in the house cleaning business, if I'm yeah. doing like maintenance, you know, maid service cleaning. I, I, if you ask your wife, uh, Tom, she would tell you, yes, I know. Cause I've heard her say but it. I'm asking, I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you, you, you want to be able to look out for each other. You want to be able to help each other, uh, if they're taking their gloves off wrong, if they have a cut in their suit, if they're vacuuming wrong, if they if they didn't change the bag in their vacuum cleaner, whatever it might be. Okay, uh, but let's let's not just try not to steer this down to doing bio containment, wearing Tyvek suits and and respirators. I mean, we're in the house cleaning business, so as much as well, we can frame this in in what we're doing as professional house cleaners. I think that would be most useful. I cringed when I heard that buddy system thing, because you know, my whole business model was built around solo cleaning and I wouldn't change it for that. Okay. Um, I would, if I still had my business today, uh, a lot, some people on this may not know me, but I, I sold our business five years ago. So uh, in the DC area, we had 45 employees or so. So I wouldn't change it for that. But if I if I had this kind of situation come up and I wanted to go in and clean and my PPE required me to have a eye protection and a mask and so forth, I might send two people in if that makes sense to you um, instead of one person. <laughs> Tom um, and I both keep unmuting at the same time. <laughs> go ahead, Tom. Liz, it's your birthday. Please go ahead. Let me see if I can talk a little softer. Is that is, is that how? Oh, you're you're not speaking too loudly, David. It's not you. It's um, every time we have three people on the call, it's always like this. Uh, okay. um, well, so I I, I think that a lot of people right now are going to um, one of the first changes that they made for in the residential cleaning was oh we're going to do solos uh, just because of the social distancing and not touching each other and driving together. Hey guys. Hey everybody. Thanks for uh, the happy birthday wishes. And that, that's um, important part of what you're talking about because that's part of the risk assessment. So if that makes sense for your company and your situation, then that's part of it. it the buddy system might be a phone call when you're done or when you arrive. It, it doesn't have to be touchy feely. Okay, so um, you're saying that the buddy system is more about one of the things that you want to be evaluating. And so going into situations and evaluating everything more than just winging it. So, so you guys know that I was a welder and a boiler maker and I got into sales and management of large mechanical operations. So everything we did was at this level that we're talking about. It was rare that I worked on a job by myself. Things were so dangerous that it was really important to be able to, uh, to be able to um, uh, have, have somebody there with you. But we had, we had to have papers on the kind of steel we had. We had to have papers on the kind of welding rods we had. We had to have papers on the process we used. We had to x-ray the joint many times that we welded on. All this stuff, right, had to be documented. All I'm saying to you is cleaning is, even house cleaning, is going to get 
more of a prof become more of a profession and less of a domestic type of activity. Okay. And, but we're going to be able to prove our outcomes. We're going to be able to get a higher grade of pay. We're going to be able to have more respect in the community and we're going to be able to help people more um, by what we know and what we do. David, was there any discussion about needing specialized training if you're going to be doing this, you know, hazard, hazardous, you know, recovery going into what people are referring to as hot sites and with the respirators and Tyvek suits and all of that? Uh, right. Do we need, so, do we, if we're going to, I, I see people talking out there and pictures on Facebook where it looks like that there's a lot of people that are getting into that. If if anybody's interested in doing that, what type of training do we need in, in, in equipment and product? What do we need to know in order to do that type of work? Don't just go out and buy a fogger. Please don't do that, okay? So uh, Why uh, is that? Why, why, what's the problem with that? Do it. So, Everybody has them. Uh, I'll give you the answer that they gave. Uh, there was tons of, you could see in the sidebar, people uh, posing questions and what kind of fogger should I buy and what's the best disinfectants to buy. And, and this is the answer that they all gave. Why are you trying to kill something with a hand grenade when something like soap and water will do in most cases? Stop it. That's what they said. So we don't need understanding how disease is transmitted, understanding how to break the chain of infection and different, different organisms, different microbes are different and they behave differently. And you have to understand something basic about germ theory. If you're going to be in the cleaning industry, you just got to, you can choose not to, but you won't go very far from this day forward. You've got to understand something about how they are a threat and how to mitigate that. So David, you are a master at changing a subject. I have got to give you credit for that. So you are really good at getting out the information that you're gonna get out. Now, I'm going back to Tom's question. <laughs> okay, and the question was, what if we are going to be dealing with this and we're going out there do we need to have any kind of specialized equipment we see people out there like with tyvek suits and all of this additional ppe but then we get mixed message on the other side the um bruce said just got well i guess it was about a week ago now really the only ppe he sees as being necessary is gloves but then why are who, we seeing who said that who said that? bruce bruce oh. dance mm, right so Bruce, that's good. That's it's a rapid good. changing situation. He might have a different answer after the series project today. Yeah, um, I, I mean, they we're talked all smiling, about that. but that's true. That's, so that's totally here's, true. here's what they're learning about this coronavirus. Uh, masks are, are being shown to knock down the and break the chain of infection. So when he was talking about gloves, he's talking about nobody in his zone, in his cleaning zone, like the house is empty or they're in the basement and you're on the top floor. So, so let me qualify. Bruce knows what he's talking about. I, I, you know that. So, uh, but here's the thing is that in normal everyday cleaning where you might be next to somebody else or you're dealing with maybe a patient in the bed who's recovering from COVID and you go in to clean, that kind of thing, you want eye protection, you want face protection, and you want, basically you want to protect your holes, okay? That's what you, that, they said that, that's what they said. So your nose, your mouth, and your eyes. And the reason that you want this is in part so you're not touching your face 20 times an hour or so. Uh, and having that on sort of prevents you from just naturally touching up there. The other thing is after you are done with the cleaning process and you dispose of your PPE and your gloves, you need to immediately wash your hands and you need to as soon as practically possible, go home and Take a shower. Critical. 
as soon as practical. So get clean. So that's the answer. PPE, mask, eye protection. It has been shown to get in the corner of the eye. And and not just your hair. And I'm glad you shaved, Tom, because mm -hmm. that works. Yeah, that was uh, that was part of the thinking. Um, was there any discussion about masks and, you know, the, obviously the N95 is the thing that everybody's talking about. It's, you know, respirator. You've got the mm -hmm. surgical masks or procedure masks. And I see a lot of people making, sewing you know, their own, you know, reusable. Um, there's a lot of concern about healthcare professionals can't get enough PPE. Was there any discussion about you know, the, the responsible thing to do is cleaning professionals. Should we be trying to hoard that up or do we want to not do that and let that go to, to the healthcare community? You want to get rolls of toilet paper and wrap around your head and that's the best filter. No, um, that's why everybody's buying all that toilet paper. Um, yes, there is a shortage of masks. Um, Yes, uh, you need to have training. If you're going to wear a mask and you never had any training, don't wear a mask uh, as a professional to go out clean. Um, Patty Olinger was a speaker. Uh, she was the head of uh, environmental health uh, at uh, Embry University uh, Hospital. And um, uh, she said she, she went in the store the other day because her, her husband's over 60 She's making fun of him about that a little bit because he's like 60 in a couple months. You know, Carrie had me go to the store the other day. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the, there was a lady in there wearing a mask and she was wearing it wrong. And she says, you know, do you mind? Could I help you? Because you're wearing that mask wrong. And I do this for a living. I actually teach people how to wear the kind of equipment you're wearing. And she goes, oh, yeah, I'll oh, show me it all this. And so they adjusted it, made it fit tight and the whole thing. Thank you so much. And she says, people are so hungry for information about how to wear PPE, what kind of disinfectants to use, what's effective on, on viruses, on other germs. People don't know and they want to know. They're so hungry and there's so much misinformation out there. Uh, Greg Whiteley talked about New Zealand's uh, health department put out a tweet that Vinegar is great on salads, but it is not a disinfectant. Stop using it. So I have a question about the masks, David. I feel like there is a conflicting message going on there. Um, and and not, not specifically to you, this is out there. Um, and the, the two messages that I'm hearing is, one, if you're going to wear a mask, great, but the main point of the mask is to keep you from touching your face and your holes, et cetera. Um, but on the other hand, then we hear, but make sure you're wearing it right. It's really important. Well, why is it really important if I'm wearing it right, if the only purpose is to keep me from touching myself? Great question. So, and, and I'll, I'll finish answering the question about the other PPE and stuff So, uh, as well. But um, it's not just for that. They're showing in studies and they showed some, you know, respirable particles coming out of people's mouths and stuff and with the mask and without the mask. And so um, there are many people that have COVID that don't know they have it right now. And they're commingling in the community and so forth. So when they wear it, you want to re reduce the risk of infection by having them wear it. And as a result, uh, uh, they're, they're not spreading it. For somebody who doesn't have it and they're wearing it um, and they respect the other things like social distancing and so forth, they show that they greatly reduce their chance because it enters through the, the holes in your face. And so ideally, you might even want to wear a face shield. It does, beyond the droplets, it does get into the air microscopically at the nano level and it does, it can survive. It has been shown to survive in a hospital setting up to three hours in the regular community where there's a lot of air movement or in a house where you have open windows or 
you know, that kind of thing, um, I, they don't think it can survive uh, that long um, in the open air. But who they don't know that. They don't know that. Um, Dave, you, made a, you made a comment earlier that I think would be worth diving into just a little bit that, you know, it's the, the actual virus itself is, 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 is fairly fragile, probably one of the most easiest class of pathogens to, 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 to deal with and, and, and mitigate. Um, if somebody calls a cleaning company and says, Hey, I've got, you know, a space here that was inhabited by somebody that uh, was diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 is it really even necessary to go in and, and disinfect it or do you just shut the door and stay out for a few days and the virus basically becomes inactive on its own? So they talked about how the virus can last longer on some surfaces than others, like on cardboard, different than on plastic, than on stainless steel. And, but all of them, um, after several days, just three, four days, the risk is like minuscule. So um, if, if the place had not been inhabited by anyone for three or four days, um, that's a big deal. Sunshine is a great thing. Taking linens outside and hanging them on the, on the line instead of putting them in your dryer. Although the dryer's heat will, um, will, will do the job and inactivate the virus as well. Now I make a point too, there's a lot of different kinds of microbes out there and in organisms that can cause uh, harm and disease and viruses are not living. They are not like a bacteria. Uh, viruses are uh, an organism that needs a host. They, they need something to attach themselves to that's alive, like you. And uh, they all viruses come from bird. Man. All viruses come from birds, and um, and they somehow mutate and adapt to get into humans, uh, typically by bad hygiene in the areas where it first starts. And that's where you hear all this news about Wuhan and China and so forth. Um, so. Um, uh, viruses, all virus, well, not all viruses, some viruses, and this virus, the coronavirus, does have an envelope surrounding it made up of fats or oils. And so um, if you take the HCT class, for example, um, or a lot of other classes on cleaning science, you'll learn that uh, soaps and detergents break down those oils or fats. And so they render the virus inactive. And so that 20 seconds of washing your hands, right? Like this, okay, thumbs and doing it and making sure that your soapy concentration is wet the whole time. And it's not all soap, you need water because the water picks it up and carries it away. That is critical. It's also critical when you're cleaning something Everybody says, well, if, it, if it's two ounces to the gallon, why can't I put five in there and kill everything? Well, you need the water, the water for all kinds of reasons, not just suspending the soil or the, the viral load or whatever is on the surface, but you need water for it to do its job in breaking down that virus. And uh, they talked about that a lot today. But going back to the PPE, the guy talked about... Um, uh, if if I didn't have a Tyvek suit like his his hospital's running low on Tyvek, so he wears waterproof rubber outfit with boots and the whole thing, and then when he takes it off, he hoses it down, or somebody does for him, and then they let it dry, and so he's not needing to wear the Tyvek suit. So if you don't have an N95, but you have some kind of mask, uh, if you have a scarf that's preventing you from, if you sneeze or cough or something, or just talking, um, it's preventing all that sputum. Somebody asked what sputum was and the, the, one of the moderators said, Google it. <laughs> so, uh, so you have to understand some of the speak, some of the nomenclature as it relates to cleaning. I will tell you this, what I'm learning 
about the science of cleaning, I believe that the science of cleaning is going to catch up with the marketing of house cleaning. Okay, everybody wants to know about how to market their house clean business and how to get the next job and how to do, you know this, Tom, I prided our company on not just getting cleaning jobs, but getting cleaning jobs at a very high price and having a high margin. I'd rather have 100 customers that paid me $200 with a margin of 40% than, you know, 500 with a margin of, you know, 15 or whatever. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot to be said for being able to command a high price because of knowledge and skill. Yeah, we've had uh, some dis prior discussions and in, in, in some of these calls just talking about how uh, the whole idea of, of, of digital marketing and standing up a website and ranking and getting some reviews was uh, in, 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 in a lot of circles, all that was necessary in order to you know, create a profitable cleaning business. But now that uh, I guess the, the community has been reminded that there is a health component associated with, uh, with cleaning and there's infectious diseases out there that we need to be mindful of as well, that the science of cleaning and hygienic cleaning is uh, starting to become uh, a lot more relevant and a, and a lot more top of mind. So, you know, that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing for society and that's a good thing for, uh, for the industry. I had somebody, uh, let me say real quick um, to piggyback on what Tom said. I had somebody say yesterday on a call that I was on that, you know, a year ago, uh, the people that were like the trunk slammers, the, the negative people in our space were the people that were going out there buying a vacuum, weren't getting registered, they weren't getting licensed, and they're just pulling their vacuum and they're cleaning homes. But in this new space, a lot of us, are like the trunk slammers of the future because we don't have the uh, the education and the knowledge that maybe we really should be having to to keep the the indoor environment as clean as it could be i thought that was interesting well and i i think that this tool that we're using right now is going to collapse that time frame yes you're going to have some competency uh, in fact, I was just going to say, Liz, before you chimed in there, that one of the things that companies can do now to answer Tom's question, uh, to keep answering it, there's a lot of things. Get your team together, even if they're at home, get them to practice. Show them something on a Zoom thing like this. Here's how I want you to dust from now on. Here's how I want you to fold the cloth from now. Here's how I want you to use gloves from now on or vacuum from now, whatever, and show them and then have them practice at home until you can get together with them again. Do something to keep them engaged. And I know maybe if they're not working for you at the moment, that could be tough, but that could also be a tool to find out who's going to come back to work for you too, because that day will come. Um, but it, it's important, I think, for people to understand that part of training and part of teaching and part of the knowledge, it has no value unless you practice doing. They talked about a lot about plan, do, check, act. You know about that, Tom. Plan, do, check, act. And you have to keep doing that and keep refining, keep experimenting, keep refining. And, and that's part of what this is about. It's important if you're going to be an owner and be responsible in this business to be an operator, not just an owner, not just an investor, but be somebody who's going to take the lead, be the general on the horse and take care of business. And that involves being knowledgeable about the science of cleaning. Go read a book. Get somebody like me or Tom or you guys you teach this stuff in your in your classes. Get with people who know the science of cleaning. There's a lot of people out there, by the way, teaching, and they're teaching their own methods, maybe, or whatever. And, and this is part of that misinformation. They're not necessarily about the science of cleaning. And it's really important that you be discerning and understanding of what really is the science of cleaning and what is misinformation. So, yep. 
Hey, David, you know, in the, in the past, a lot of times if, if the question is asked, is it, you know, is it clean? It was a matter of how does it look? How does it smell? Was there any discussion about how we're going to determine if something is clean and, and, and measure, measure that? Is that going to be something that's going to be uh, more in the forefront moving forward? Yeah. So, um, so uh, Richard Shaughnessy and, and uh, John Richter talked about that. These are really world-renowned gurus, uh, research guys. So um, what they said was basically what I explained in, in a speech last year that I gave at the Siri conference, and I'll just repeat that, and then we can talk about it. Um, there are no protocols for house cleaning. There's no standards. There's no anything. So I came up with my own for my own company. And uh, I took an ATP meter. It's, it stands for adenosine triphosphate. Um, and uh, you can buy one of these meters. Um, there you go. You got one in your hand. That little lid lifts off and uh, a Q-tip swab inside of a plastic tube goes down inside it after you. There you go. And uh, what happens is uh, in 60 seconds after you, you have to do a little twist thing and break open a capsule after you've swapped a surface um, and you put it in that tube. And in 60 seconds, there's a, a number on that meter that will show if it's dirty, uh, you might see a number of 800 or 900 or 400 or 1200 or something. But if it's clean, you're going to get down in the double digits or less, even even five or 10. Um, and so uh, what it does is um, soil has a unique uh, characteristic and adenosine triphosphate specifically is a building block of all living things. And so there's a residue, if you will, of ATP on everything that has been alive. And so uh, when you measure that, there's a relationship between bacteria and pathogens. Did I mute? Oh, sorry. So there's a relationship between pathogens and, and, um, and ATP, and they've been able to figure that out. So if you get that number down to 10, now, if you go into a home and you do a before check and it's 3,000, and you clean one time with one method or process, one cleaning cloth, and you get it down to 800, well, that's pretty good. You do it again and you get it down to five, then you are able to measure your before and after. And so then you can document, okay, well, in this situation, if we clean twice with this stuff, uh, how much solution we use, what kind of cloth we use, how many times we wipe, do we need to agitate first and do a rinse or whatever we have to do. So everything is going to be different. A bathroom is going to be different than uh, a, a, a living room. Wet work is going to be different than dry work, but you need to have a protocol for everything. And ATP is one of the methods. UV light's another method, fluorescence. Um, and they actually have the spray. You can spray on your hands or other things that mimic germ load. And then you can wash your hands with soap and water and see how good a job you did. You put your hand under the UV light and you can tell. So uh, when Brandy was going, my daughter went to nursing school. She's been an ER nurse for many years now. And she went to nursing school. They had her do that in her training and so forth. So you can do things like that to teach people about how to get from uh, a baseline of, okay, here's, here's what the soil is, here's what the, here's what the goal is, and here's the things you have to do to get it there. And then that's how we designed our cleaning protocols and our processes. Um, and so we didn't have gray out in the carpet along the baseboards. We didn't allow that. We had tools and methods to quickly get that. And also part of it is being able to be efficient. They talked about that. Somebody came up with some uh, idea about how to, um, how to clean something. They said, but that's going to take you forever. So they, they're not living in the 
septic world of a laboratory or, or antiseptic world, they, they, they understand that you have to be efficient in the clean process. And so, wow. these sci scientists want to work with us. They want to work with us just like we want to know the stuff. Tom, can you talk to us a little bit more about um, the testing aspect, David? Because the testing is, you know, an ATP meter is pretty pricey. Then you have to buy the little swabs. Are you supposed to test every house? I mean, what what's realistic for residential cleaning as far as testing? So certainly there are thresholds, just like you don't start out with 27 employees. You have to, you know, ramp up, right? That takes time. At some point in your evolution of your company, you may not afford a, a, an ATP meter or find a need for it on a, on a regular basis, um, but you might want to hire somebody. You might want to hire me, and I'll come out and design your cleaning protocol for you, and I have an ATP meter, and I'll show you how to use it and show you Maybe your process works great. Maybe it has to be adjusted a little bit. And we would work on that together. And there's other people that do that kind of thing, too. I'm not the only one. I'm not here. This is not a sales call, by the way. But I do that kind of thing for people. I did it for my own company. And so I was able to tell our story and get like the chair of Georgetown Nursing was one of our clients. Uh, we had kids with lung transplants there. Uh, uh, lung transplants, their parents called us. They didn't care what the price was. So those are the kinds of clients you get when, and, and they're willing to pay. And you know that you know how to do a good job. When I was a welder, I didn't have to wonder if that gas pipe was welded right. I knew how to do it. And that's what, that's what these professionals that are in this space of training and teaching are going to start being do, doing this on scale. And uh, I'm excited to be part of that. I'm excited to be part of the clean industry research Institute because of it, because that's where this industry is going. I do think it's exciting too, um, David. Hey, uh, over here, I see we have a question, uh, maybe not a question, it was a comment. You had mentioned earlier that um, all viruses come from birds. And Greg says, um, or bats, is that, do you have any bats, information? Bat, yeah, bats or bats. And, and they didn't clarify that today, but I, I wanted to ask them bats because I know that too. But um, I don't know if we can say everything. How about the swine flu? The, the birds give it to the swine. And, okay, so we have over here, we have another question. So Robin's saying highly specialized service with ATP monitoring. Yeah, I would agree. Um, but Kevin says, how about the UV flashlight, David? Is it a real tool or is it a gimmick? No, it, it really is a tool. It, it does work. Um, uh, you have to know how to use it. You have to be trained on that too. Um, it's not like, you know, back when I was young, everybody had those in their bedroom. And um, they just called them black lights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, they, 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 they do have a utility. They do have a utility. Uh, and they, they require some training on, on how to use them properly. Just like when you're washing your hands, that germ stuff that you spray on there, you need to know how to use them properly. Just like, just like a vacuum cleaner. So, So I, I know I have, um, this is sort of a, a constant question that pops up. And it is like, how do I decide for the companies that have decided to stay open, they wanna be of service, they wanna do, you know, they wanna do their part to break the chain of infection. How, how do they make that decision? When, when should I not go into a home? How do I determine this home is not safe for my people, even though they've been trained, they have the correct PPE, they know how to use it, et cetera. This place is not safe. What What are those criteria? And when should you just say, sorry? So, so here's some. Uh, I think okay. you have to start from the top down. Virginia just a couple days ago said, uh, if you're not an essential worker and you don't have an ID, uh, if you go out on the street, you could, you could get fined. 
Uh, in Maryland, some are. I know in your state, Liz, uh, somebody was fined $1,500 the other day because they didn't have a good reason to be out in the community. Um, so I think that's number one. Number two is, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, Tom and I have had this discussion in the last couple of weeks a few times. And, you know, what is it? Are you trying to make 50 bucks? Is I mean, is that what it's really about? Or are you really trying to maybe take care of a an elderly person who can't clean themselves? And you know what? Is it really going to make a difference? Uh, that 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 extra vacuuming that you you know you maybe maybe uh, maybe not coming for a couple of weeks is not a big deal. Uh, maybe their daughter can come over and clean for them until you get back one time or, you know, she's already there helping to take care of them. So all of those things, I think almost even on a customer by customer basis. And then do you have employees that are willing to go out there? You know, they're not like a hospital staff that maybe signed up for this kind of thing. And even some hospital staff are saying, look, I didn't sign up to work without any proper PPE. So do you have the proper PPE to send a person out into the community, into somebody's home? You don't know where they've been or what's been going on. Are they well, going to be home? Are they not going to be home? You know, that's what I'm asking. I think maybe you misunderstood my question. Um, my question was, so earlier you said, um, you said if somebody isn't in the home, it's probably safe to clean there. You also said if somebody was infected that after they have been out of the home for three, I think you said three days, that chances are good that it would be a safe place to be in. So what I'm trying to say is there's no blanket statement, Liz, there's no blanket yeah. statement. But for me, if I still yeah. had my company today, we would be shut down. OK, that's for me. But I can't yeah. speak for everybody. And I know that in some cases, I know Tom and you guys are shut down uh, with a couple of rare exceptions where the people are specially trained, where the customer has a special need, where there's a special circumstance. And the proper risk assessment has been done with all the players involved. And so... I don't see that happening with most house cleaning customers. Uh, you have the rebel teenager who goes, sneaks out at night, you know, how do you control that? And then he sneezes on his sheets and you're changing them three hours later. You can't control that. That's, uh, that puts you at risk. And I don't know how long that would be. Like, if I had to shut my company down today, I that would be. I would break my heart for a lot of people because my employees were like family to me, you know. So it's. Tough. Well, I know a lot. I know a, a lot of a lot of companies are trying to clean for a lot of reasons. Um, I, I know a bunch of people that are, and I know a lot of the different reasons. Um, um, absolutely some for some physical safety, some psychological safety. Um, um, there are a lot of different things that they're trying to do. Um, and, and there are a lot of the different reasons why. Um, like, like I have a doctor that's a client um, in, in my area and he's increased service to his home because he doesn't like the idea that he leaves the hospital, comes home to his family. So he wants his home cleaned regularly. Um, before he was every other week, he moved up to weekly and then he moved up to twice a week. So um, I, I, th maybe that's just a psychological safety thing. Maybe he should know better that that there's no need for, for cleaning. I, I don't know, but I do know that he needs somebody to come clean to be able to continue doing his job. Uh, and, and, and that wasn't actually maybe, my question. My, maybe my it's question for his was, wife. Maybe. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> and, and, and it absolutely could be. Uh, so, but my question was, if somebody has um, found out, like, like, let's say that the, a company is open. This question came up today, earlier this morning. Um, 
and her company is cleaning and I can't remember the exact details, but I think they went to the home and the customer said that they had been uh, around somebody or something that had been um, infected or I, I'm not even sure what the details were. Um, and then later said, yeah, I actually had COVID two weeks ago when you guys were here. So how, and of course no, nothing happened to any other people. So the people that cleaned the house two weeks ago, uh, now they're not sick and they have no symptoms. Are they, you know, I, and I know everybody knows this idea of you can be asymptomatic and you can pass it on. You know, how does that whole thing play out? Because have you like, ever you heard have of had, Sorry, Russian what? Russian roulette. That's what they're doing. I have. That, that's what that that's what the game you just described is is that's what they're playing. Russian roulette. So, so like all of the people at like Costco, they had a confirmed case at Costco, right? And uh, they didn't shut down the Costco's. Um, the thinking is that people need food or whatever, and they're not delivering it to the home. Still got to come in there. So is there any way to be safe if you want to go to a Costco? Because we know that there's been a confirmed case at Costco. Was no. that all, all Costco's or just the one that was infected? No, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm talking about just the one. Well, I don't know. Do you think it can travel to all Costco's, David? <laughs> I can, I yes, can there is it. there is a way to go that's safe. Uh, there is a way to go that's safe, but it's not the way that I see most people going. In fact, I was there the other day, and I saw a Loudoun County deputy sheriff that I know, and he's talking to the service guy for tires, just like you know, two feet away, just sipping his coffee, and they're having a discussion, and I'm got. I, I was like, I had my mask on, my gloves. I got to get my stuff and get out of here. That's that's what I that's what I did. It's kind of like a presidential press conference. <laughs> exactly. Um, I shouldn't have said that. Strike that from the record. Um, you know, I went to Costco uh, the other week, and they had their greeters with wipes wiping down the handles of the uh, of the carts, which I guess is a good idea, but it caught my attention that they were using baby wipes and there's no antimicrobial anything in baby wipes. I mean, it looked good. And I guess it's maybe had some efficacy over doing nothing, but I think a lot of that was psychological. It gave the perception that they were sanitizing and disinfecting something. And all they were doing was like just using a baby wipe. Well, soapy water, you know, some of those baby wipes are soapy and, and that might have been effective. I don't know. But I, had some I, to say. I will tell you this, that person doing that probably I would I would venture to say 95 percent chance that they had no idea that they were being effective or not. And that was what we talked about today a lot was that the people who are actually doing the cleaning, they're not sure what they're doing. They're not. When I was a welder, if I was welding a gas pipe and and I wasn't sure if I knew what I was doing or not, how long do you think that would last? Well, we're and, we're we're pushing up on on an hour here, and I've got a couple of questions that I want to try to get back to. Um, Winter was asking about the new FMLA law and wanting to know, um, you know, do we still have to pay them FMLA leave? The new FMLA law says if you rehire your employee after April 1st, you still have to pay them leave. Is that right? It's my understanding anybody on your payroll as of tomorrow is a candidate to take FMLA leave if they meet the criteria, and that could be taking care of a sick family member, or I believe even if they have a child that's out of school that they need to take care of. And, or if they're sick themselves, they could qualify for the sick pay as, as well. Um, 
question about is it better to put your employee on part time or lay off some and let the others work full time? I'm working at 30%. I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer that. Um, I, I honestly don't know. There's pros and cons to both. And I think the final answer to that question in terms of what's the best thing to do won't be known until sometime down the road because we're still waiting on a lot of the regulations to be written for the laws that were passed last week. That if you ask the individuals that are responsible for for regulating and enforcing some of these uh, these laws, they don't know themselves yet because they haven't even figured out how they're going to do it. So, um, you know, I would consult with my 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 CPA. I would consult with with with, with people that that you work most closely with in your local market, and you know, make your best guess and keep your fingers crossed is the best I've got. Um. Did you, Robin wanted to know if there's a cheaper way of measuring a uh, more affordable device to measure microbe levels on a surface. Um, I don't know. Most ATP meters are somewhere in the ballpark of $1,500 or more, give or take, just, to, just depending. The swabs are typically around two bucks a pop. And there's several different vendors that, that, that do both. Um, I don't know, David. Is there a, a more uh, more economical way to to to, to measure removing soil surface? Um, we're fond of saying that only science can see, and so uh, the visual is is something. Uh, the smell is something too. But in regard to this threat, um, I I think the ATP actually is not very effective in looking at a virus uh, load on a surface, actually. So um, I think uh, um, uh, the UV light certainly has some value for some things, but again, not for this. Um, I think uh, what they talked about is very, very critical that... Um, everybody wants to spray everything or fog everything really really critical for you to wipe wipe things scrub things that scrubbing action or that wiping action is very effective in removing the viral load especially if you're using soapy water or some disinfectant on the epa site a lot of people get confused about disinfectants they are not cleaners and it is important to clean and then disinfect according to the label instructions. Critical for you to understand that. In some cases, it was talked about that you need to disinfect first for the protection of the worker and then come in and clean and then disinfect a final time. We, so, uh, we, we talked yesterday a little bit about disinfectants and the legal aspects of it in terms of how, you know, the, the, FIFRA law passed in 48 and how the EPA uses that to, to, to regulate what could even be called a disinfectant and what we as, as, as contractors, cleaning professionals, our, our uh, liability in that, that if you pick up a disinfectant and read the label, the first thing it says is it's a violation of federal law to use this in any way that's not prescribed on this label. So, um, you know, to my knowledge, you know, people you know, aren't going to jail because they didn't follow the label. But I think I could see, I could see things happening in this new world where people are taking disinfectants and putting them in foggers and employees are, you know, breathing, you know, this toxic, you know, stuff that could hurt them. I see a lot of litigation coming down the path, path that's going to use that label on the back of that disinfectant as uh, plaintiff's exhibit A if 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 we aren't careful and, and using those disinfectant mm -hmm. properly. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna respond for all the people that stayed on this call after six o'clock. Here's here's the dessert, okay? Here's the cherry's jubilee for you. Okay. Number one, my nose has bled more than once from cleaning chemicals and being in a confined space. So I know about cleaning and I know about taking risks and doing what you shouldn't be doing. But here's what I wanna share with you. 
The cleaning chemicals that you buy at Walmart or Costco are completely different from the chemicals and clean solutions that you're gonna buy at a Janssen distributor. And here are some of the reasons why. The government says that there is a perm permissible allowance of exposure. And uh, if, if you are buying a consumer product, they're expecting you maybe to use that product once every week or two, possibly. But if you take that product out and you spray that around in a shower and you're breathing those fumes or that gassing that comes from aerosolizing that in the spray bottle and you're doing that in five showers a day, um, that's not a consumer product anymore. And you're putting your people at risk or yourself at risk if you're doing that. And why? Because when you breathe disinfectant fumes, you are killing yourself. Disinfectants kill, that's what they're designed to do. And you breathe it into your lungs and your body. You're a, you're a living person. And what do you think that does for your lungs? What, how long do you think that's gonna last? So stop it, stop doing that kind of stuff. I encourage you strongly to work with a Jansan distributor it, it, as soon as you possibly can, I know that may take a year for some of you, but work with a Janssen distributor who will train you and teach you about the proper use of chemicals, and they'll be your partner. And you might still have to go to two or three. I went with two or three different companies and got different products from different places. But that is gold for most startup cleaning companies to learn about that. Yeah, Thanks, you know, it is helpful. It is. That's 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 good information. It's important. You know, it's, it's cleaning business operators. I think that we've kind of been thrown into the deep end of the pool here on having to learn a whole lot of new stuff at the same time. The whole idea of pathogens and the chain of infection and, and, and doing hygienic cleaning at the same time. You know, we're having to deal with a lot of new laws on on the, on the employee side, and at the same time, we're having to figure out all kinds of new things about about finance, uh, small business administration, and any one of these things in and of itself would be consuming us, but we've got all of this coming at us at the same time, and it's a lot. And we've got a couple of questions here on the finance side. Linda's asking about the $10,000 grant, and uh, can you still apply for the full SBA loan? If so, how? And she says that she'll be doing the PPE with her uh, local bank. Um, the emergency loan that comes through the SBA through the SBA website is the same process as a $10,000 grant. If you've gone to the website, which they rebuilt over the weekend and launched yesterday, um, if you've gone through that process on the SBA website, you've applied for the $10,000 grant. And you've also applied for the emergency loan to get the PPP loan. You need to go to a bank you know, that uh, does uh, SBA loans and uh, you basically just call the bank that you do business with and if they do it they'll help you if not they'll tell you who in your community can help you with that um, hmm. any other questions here that we're missing David Greg wants yeah. to go, uh, go ahead yeah, oh yeah that was it the one from Greg do you think glove and mask are enough or should we use goggles at Costco? Goggles or at least safety glasses, not these kind of glasses, but safety glasses at least, but goggles would be better. Goggles or if you're not embarrassed, I'm not embarrassed. I don't care. Uh, have you ever seen a face shield? You know, I use some, a grinder face shield would work. Here's what the guy said. He says, we didn't, we asked the police in New York it, what they had for protective equipment. He said, do you have face? No, we don't have anything. They looked in the trunk of their car. They had riot gear, right? They said, wear the riot gear. That will work. So figure out how to adapt. I have a, I have a, um, a grinding shield, you know, for when you're grinding metal and stuff that just pops down. It's a clear plexiglass thing or plastic thing. Wear that, you know. Who cares whether people are, I don't want you to die because you were embarrassed to go to Costco with a mask on. Wear the mask and wear the goggles and wear everything you had to protect the holes in your face. 
I, I have a question, David, around the face shields. I was a little confused by that when I saw, and it might just be because I didn't see it being used correctly. Um, I saw somebody using a face shield, but they didn't have anything on underneath it, and yeah, I didn't see how that best. would be. Yeah, you, ideally, I mean, it's better than nothing, but you, at least you need to have the you need ideally need to have the mask too. Okay, yeah, that makes so much more sense to me. I'm like. If the mask needs to, and the respirator needs to fit perfectly, how does a face shield that has all of this openness work? Maybe, so, okay, were, that, you, that's super helpful. were you like, was it Darth Vader or? <laughs> no, just... That was it. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Um, I am going. Tom, you need to do your, you got to do your homework, Tom. I'm efforting. Okay. So at the end of this call, Tom always puts us up a, a nice link for cleaning business today. And then we also talk about what we're going to do tomorrow. And uh, we like if anybody has any questions or concerns that they've heard of and they're not sure about and they just like to hear Tom tell it like it is, then let me know uh, what that is and we'll make sure that that happens as well. Um, I actually, one of the things I heard, Tom, I've heard this multiple times now, that if you apply for SBA loan and you get the $10,000 grant money or the, that initial $10,000 that turns into a grant, that you are then not eligible to apply for the PPP. But I've also heard that that's not at all true, that you can apply for both and that the $10,000 will just apply to the other. Can you speak to that? It's my understanding that you can apply to both. I would uh, talk to my local bank that does the SBA lending for the PPP to confirm that. But uh, we had a lot of discussion about that yesterday and how the funds are used within your business can be affected by which loans you have. There's there's rules that 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 kind of dictate how you can use those funds, but uh, but you can apply for, for, for both. And the $10,000 grant and the uh, emergency loan, all of that, again, is through the website and the PPE is through, through a local bank. Um, um, also, Kevin's got some interesting information here. He says that you need to go on and um, apply for the new new loan, even if you previously um, applied for the longer EIDL, if you did the application, because um, it, it sounds like you'll need to do that to get the uh, $10,000. Right? Is that what I'm reading? We were looking for a definitive answer for that yesterday and didn't have one, but the consensus was if you're going to be wrong, be wrong by applying twice. So yeah. if you haven't done it through the website, go ahead and do it. Thank you, Bridget, and I'm glad this has been helpful to everybody. Um, uh, tomorrow we're going to have Joe back, I believe. Is that correct, Tom? I think that's the plan. Okay, for a I little bit more plan. financial conversation, so get your questions ready. Okay, Cleaning Business Today website, cleaningbusinessday.com. On the right-hand side, you can subscribe, email, first name, last name. We're sending out... Um, newsletters, please uh, subscribe to that. There's a link here. If you do forward slash and coronavirus dot or dash downloads, all the resources that we've shown over the last uh, several weeks now, I guess, are all here for access and download. Yesterday, Joe shared his uh, response plan template, which was an awesome, uh, template that you can use to kind of get your mind wrapped around how you want to manage your business through this, uh, this, this Corona this coronavirus, uh, crisis. And he, uh, put in the letter for his staff for the uh, work stoppage as well. And both of those are there for download. I'll copy this and we'll drop it in chat.
Yep, there we go. I moved my uh, operation inside today off the porch. There is a, a tornado watch. Evidently, there's some storms been in the southeast, and they're supposed to be coming over our head here shortly. And I think the rain started anyway. So we'll uh, hunker down and keep our fingers crossed. Like a uh, a pandemic's not enough. They got to throw a tornado on top of us. Thank you guys for having me on. It's been fun. Yeah, thank you so much, David. I think you uh, dispelled a lot of um, little mini myths that have been out there for quite a while. So super helpful. If anybody wants to get in touch with me or talk more, uh, I'm on Facebook and they can reach out to me that way. That's probably as good a way as any. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hit us up with your questions. We'll be back here tomorrow at uh, 5 o'clock Eastern. Thank you, guys. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Bye.